Thank you all again for joining us for Facebook Live Planetarium Online. This is somewhere around the 26th of the programs that we have done in this series. So I'm Mike, the Planetarium Director at Liberty Science Center. As I was saying earlier, we're very happy to announce that we are open again at the mothership, Liberty Science Center in Jersey City. We are open Thursdays through Sundays and have planetarium shows on an hourly basis during the day. But uh, we are, uh, in September, continuing these online programs as well, using the exact same Digistar program that we're also using in our main uh, theater. We are also using Digistar to bring the planetarium to your home screens as well. So Krista is here with us in the chat, and she will be answering your questions as the program goes on, so put your questions in there. The show will last around 25 minutes, and we'll leave time at the end also to answer your questions then. I wanted to mention that we also have a special event this coming Monday at 8 p.m. on Facebook. So every year, Liberty Science Center honors great achievements in science and technology with our annual Genius Gala fundraiser. This year, it's a virtual gala. It's going to be online. It's going to be on Facebook, just like this show is. And if you wanted to join us, you're welcome to. We'll have a number of honorees who've made a great impact in areas like the uh, study of COVID and great breakthroughs in science and technology. And also looking at some teenage achieve achievers, including a teenager who discovered recently an exoplanet, a planet around a star beyond our own solar system. So that's 8 o'clock on Monday night, the 21st. We'd have, love to have you join us for that. There'll even be a mini planetarium show, five-minute-long tour of the planets that we'll be doing as part of that Genius Gala. All right, so uh, if you wanted to support us, so we are continuing this program as a public service. There is no cost whatsoever for joining our live program, but if you wanted to hit the little LSC logo donate button, that would help us to keep our... Uh, astronomy and STEM education alive and well as we uh, continue our outreach programming here to our community. All right, that said, we're going to be talking in this show about uh, satellites, mainly the International Space Station, but also the Hubble Space Telescope. You may or may not know that you can actually see these satellites in the sky, and if you can figure out when they appear and predict them, your friends will think you have magical powers. And so by the end of this 25-minute program, we hope to instill you with those skills to wow your friends as you predict a satellite and then see it appear in the sky. So let's head out to the sky tomorrow night. So tomorrow night, there's going to be a really good appearance of the International Space Station, blazingly bright. So here it is at 6 o'clock tomorrow, uh, Friday, the uh, 18th of September. So we're going forward one day. There is the sun. Now, uh, we're going to go to just past sunset. Now, we are just four days away from the first day of fall on the 22nd of September. So that is one of the two days a year when the sun rises exactly east and sets exactly west. First day of fall and the first day of spring. It's also called the equinox because day and night are equal on the first day of fall and the first day of spring. Equinox means equal night in Latin. And generally the sun should rise at 6 and set at 6, but we're on daylight saving time, so the sun's going to set about 7 o'clock here uh, this time of year. But directionally it's really kind of cool because you can uh, use the sun to mark off exactly where west is this time of year only. So it sets exactly in the west. So we'll wait for about an hour for it to get dark, dark and uh, slowly the stars will come out. So we're looking towards the western sky tomorrow night. Here we are. We're going to stop at 8.10 in the evening. Now looking towards the west, almost exactly west, the brightest star you can see in the evening sky in this uh, part of the world in September is the one called Arcturus. It's a good example of a first magnitude star. So first magnitude, whether you're in Hollywood or in astronomy, means a really bright star. So Arcturus is the fourth brightest star in the entire sky and the brightest one you can see uh, in the September evening sky here in New Jersey. It's a bright star in Bootes, which is often or is supposed to be a herdsman, although actually it is better seen perhaps as a nice cream cone. Imagine here is the pointed sugar cone itself and then here is a giant lump of ice cream on top of it. 
That may be hard, so let's put a picture on as well. But I kind of like showing the ice cream cone because uh, just as summer is fading away with its ice cream trucks, the Mr. Uh, Frosty ice cream truck trucks, the constellation of Botes will be lower every night and we'll lose it eventually as we go into the early fall. So that is the brightest thing you can see in terms of the stars, is that bright star Arcturus. But there's another star that is also quite bright called Antares, which is also going to be visible in the western sky around 8 o'clock tomorrow night. Antares means the rival of Mars. As you may know, Ares is a Greek word for the same god that the Romans called Mars. And Ant is where we get the word antagonist. So Antares is Mars' rival, has the same color as the planet Mars, although right now the real Mars, which is rising in the east around 10 o'clock tonight, is far brighter than Antares is. Antares is the bright star in the scorpion. Here is the claw, the heart, Antares, and the stinger of the archetypal constellation of the summertime called the scorpion, Scorpius. It's also the first of all the summer constellations to disappear. So to go into early October, it's going to set when the sun does. So we only have a week or two to catch this classic constellation of the summer before we lose it behind the setting sun. So last chance to say goodbye to Antares and to the scorpion. And also uh, we'll be losing uh, Arcturus as well before too much longer. So classic summertime constellations going away. Now, these are the brightest stars, so Antares and Arcturus, but they're not the brightest things in the sky that you're going to see. Uh, brighter than either of these first magnitude stars is the planet Jupiter. So look around the sky, try to pick out the brightest dot you can see here at 810. Jupiter is the brightest thing you can see in the sky in terms of dots of light until the space station makes its appearance in a few minutes. So over here is the planet Jupiter. So things that are really, really bright, that are brighter than first magnitude, are given negative numbers. And so Jupiter is actually minus 2.4 magnitude. So it's three times brighter than the brightest star in the sky. So there's Jupiter at minus 2.44 magnitude, much brighter than any star you can see. And the brightest thing you can see over in that part of the sky in the evening until the space station appears. So the space station is going to be minus 3.7 magnitude. It's going to be three times brighter than Jupiter. So just as Jupiter is brighter than the brightest star, the space station appearance we're waiting for is going to be three times brighter than Jupiter. Hence the fact that for we city dwellers, the uh, space station is the ideal satellite to try to spot. By the way, we also have uh, the planet Saturn next to Jupiter. They'll be together all the way till the end of December. And uh, Saturn shines at zero magnitude. So a little brighter than the two stars, Arcturus and Antares, but nowhere near as bright as its current companion, the planet Jupiter. All right, so here we have setting things up here. Uh, we are expecting a satellite appearance at 8.14 tomorrow night. This is, again, Friday night, the 18th, tomorrow night, if you're viewing this program live. So look over towards the southwestern sky, kind of near where the scorpion is. I'll get the clock going. And look for a brilliant dot rising somewhere around 8.14. Now, having organized many satellite viewing parties, the most nerve-wracking part in real life is those few moments where you hope you made all your predictions right as you're waiting for the space station or the Hubble Space Telescope to actually appear. And as you get to about one minute before it's alleged to appear, oh, here we go. Do you see it now? So blazing away here, rising here now, or actually becoming visible around 8.14 there is the International Space Station. And as you can see, if you follow it, uh, brighter even than the planet Jupiter, three times brighter to be exact. Now, it will have a very steady light and will move very smoothly across the sky, as you see here, taking five minutes to cross the sky in real life, and will vanish in the northeast uh, near the constellation of Cassiopeia the Queen. 
So that gives you a very good impression of what exactly it looks like. It'll take longer in real life. It takes about five minutes for it to cross the sky, appearing at 8.14 tomorrow night, going away about 8.20. If you see a dot of light that is flashing lights, red or green, you're seeing an airplane. There's a few external lights on the space station, but you can't see them because the station is 250 miles above our heads. You only see the station because, like the moon, it reflects the light of the sun. So that's the past tomorrow night, and it should be amazing. We're expecting the weather to get better as the weekend goes on. Saturday night, we're going to end our show by showing you a pass on Saturday night that's just as good as this one. It looks like it's going to be really good weather for Saturday here in the Northeast. But first of all, what I wanted to do is to actually uh, to view this same pass we just saw from 8.14 to 8.20, Friday night the 18th. But now we're going to leap off of Earth and view that pass looking over the shoulder of the International Space Station. So let's say goodbye to Earth for a moment. Modern day planetarium software allows us to do this. I love doing this. If you've seen my shows in the past, I love pulling away from Earth and being able to identify a few things. Let's stop here for a moment. We're looking down on Liberty State Park, which is where Liberty Science Center is located. And here is Liberty Science Center itself. There is our large parking lot, and this dome right here is the Jennifer Chalstey Planetarium. That is the largest planetarium in the Western Hemisphere. It is a major part of Liberty Science Center. Route 78 goes right past it, so I would imagine many of you, as you've gone down Route 78, have seen our big dome from the freeway as you, as you pass us. Now, I'm going to pull it a little bit further to give you a better sense geographically of where we're located. So here, more of a bird's eye view. If you try to find Liberty Science Center now, it uh, may be a little bit of a challenge, but we're right there. There's our dome still. You can see the entire park now, which is great. Over here is where the Statue of Liberty is located. Liberty Science Center, of course, is named for the Statue of Liberty. Here is Ellis Island with its fantastic immigration museum. And here is Lower Manhattan. Here is Governor's Island, and here is Brooklyn. So as you can see, we're a very easy hop from Manhattan over to Liberty Science Center. So we're hoping that some of you can make your way. Uh, those of you who have seen our online programs can come and come to our actual planetarium. We've actually had a few folks join us already who saw our online shows this summer and have come to our dome. So we would love to see you in the dome. Uh, with our setup here, the folks that are doing these online programs, Mike, Andrew, and Krista are exactly the same folks you'll be see, seeing doing our shows in the dome. So we're going to pull out further here because our point is to check out the International Space Station itself. So we're pulling so far away that we'll eventually see the Earth as a globe. And now we're going to uh, pick up our story as the space, International Space Station is passing over Mexico. So let's bring the space station on. So to orient you over here, we, this is Mexico. Here is Baja, California. And you can just barely see the northeast coming into view. So let's head off and pick up the clock around 8.10 on Friday night, kind of the same point where we began our observation from Earth looking up at the space station a moment ago. So now we're passing over the eastern part of the U.S. So here we have uh, Atlanta, for example. And this brings up a very important point. So notice right now, here at 8.13, just before the space station appears from New Jersey, that it's still light in the western half of the U.S., but it's uh, the eastern half, the eastern seaboard is in darkness. So that is very important for when you can see satellites like the space station. So you have to be in darkness to see a satellite. When a satellite goes overhead at midnight, you can't see it because the Earth blocks the sun from hitting it. And you can't see a satellite during the day because it's lost in the blazing light of the sun. You have to be in darkness. But the satellite above your head has to still be catching the rays of the sun. And so that means that satellites are only visible ever uh, from sunset to about two and a half to three hours after sunset or for the three hours before sunrise. That's the only circumstance where you are in darkness 
while the satellite itself is still catching the rays of the sun. So that is an important thing about when they're visible. Now we're heading towards 814. So over here we have the blaze of Long Island, Manhattan, and New Jersey. So we're about there. Also, you can see Philadelphia. You can see Boston and the Cape just barely as the satellite passes overhead. So it takes the International Space Station about 93 minutes to orbit the planet Earth. And one key thing is that it goes very high up on Earth to about 52 degrees north latitude and all the way down to about 52 degrees south latitude. And so it basically goes around the Earth over 15 times a day, has 15 sunrises and 15 sunsets as it orbits our planet. We look away for a moment. I'm just checking to see if there's any pressing items here. And so that is a quick bit about catching the space station. And at the end of our show, we'll be talking about websites that tell you exactly when these things will appear. But that's a great appearance coming up tomorrow night, uh, beginning at 8.14 in the evening and lasting to 8.20. Minus 3.7 magnitude means it'll be three times as bright as Jupiter. All right, so satellites. Satellites were imagined, like many things in science, long before we actually had satellites here in this popular science uh, article from May of 1949. They're asking, is U.S. building a new moon? The famous science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke, who wrote Childhood's End and 2001 A Space Odyssey, postulated the existence of satellites in the 40s, about 10 years before they came along. But the fact is, when the satellites did come along, we freaked out in the U.S. because the first satellite, Sputnik here, was launched by the Soviet Union in, on October 4, 1957, and led to us realizing that the Soviets seemed to be well ahead of us in space technology. It began the space race. Now, Sputnik here was the size of a beach ball. A year later, the U.S. launched the first satellite of its fleet called Explorer 1, and Explorer 1 looks really dramatic in the upcoming picture here. Uh, it, uh, but it actually was also quite small. These early satellites were quite small, 80 inches long. You see it real size here. So these early satellites, like Sputnik and Explorer, could never be seen. They're way too small to be seen reflecting the light of the sun. You need bigger satellites to, to, tell the, to spot them. There's now about 2,000 active satellites and a number of pieces of space debris as well. And satellites do range enormously in size, from being the size of a watermelon, even smaller than Sputnik, which is the size of, well, actually about the size of a, of a watermelon. The uh, CubeSat satellites, for example, are sort of watermelon or beach ball sized. Some are the size of a grand piano, like, uh, like Jason, uh, maybe 1,500 pounds. And larger satellites, like the uh, GEOS-15, are roughly the size of a hippopotamus up to the size of a pickup truck. And so you can occasionally see these, but they're still fairly small and not really good reflectors of light. So that's the one thing about the space station. It is by far the largest of all the satellites, besides being the only one that has human beings on board of it. It's been inhabited for 20 years. So it's on a whole different scale entirely. It's 400 feet long, larger than a football stadium, uh, field. And if I compare it to the second largest satellite, here is the Hubble Space Telescope. The Hubble is about 45 feet long there. There's the Hubble Space Telescope. So it's one-tenth the length of the International Space Station. Space Station. So you can also see the Hubble. We'll talk about spotting the Hubble as well. But not surprisingly, the Hubble is nowhere near as bright in the sky as the space station because the space station is absolutely enormous and also happens to have these really shiny, reflective solar panels. So the space station is it in terms of being by far the easiest satellite to spot, especially from us, from our bright city. So it took dozens of space missions to build the International Space Station. So the Hubble was launched in a single space shuttle launch, and yet it took about 40 launches to build the space station. Zarya, the first one launched by the Russians in 1998, November 1998, 
Uh, so for the first couple of years, these units were not inhabited. Zarya, Unity, and Zvezda were the first three units. But then over the course of 10 years, using Russian launches and the space shuttle, we built this space station. It's been inhabited con continuously for 20 years as of this November. So November 2020 uh, will mark the 20th anniversary of a permanent human presence on the space station. And uh, that is double the record of the last uh, space station, Mir, which uh, was inhabited for 10 years straight. So there you have this really bright thing in space, the space, uh, International Space Station, reflecting light well. Now, I'm going to also talk a bit about the Hubble Space Telescope, but for a sense of scale, the space station is 400 feet long, and Hubble is about 45 feet long. So for comparison, here is our astronaut next to the Hubble as, during one of the repair missions of the Hubble Space Telescope. And so you can get a better sense that the Hubble, although large, the largest satellite besides the space station, fits into the cargo bay of the, of the space shuttle. Here's another, yeah, so there is the Hubble. Hubble is also uh, orbits higher than the space station, and that's another reason why it's not quite as bright. So that's one reason why the space station is your perfect thing to observe, is that it is really, really, really bright. The other thing has to do with its orbit in terms of why it's a great target and why far more of us can see the space station than many satellites. So here's uh, the path of the International Space Station in red. So a thing to realize right away is that the international, it really is international. It was primarily the U.S. and the Russians working together on this project, although Japan and the European Space Agency, the Canadian Space Agency, and others are also involved. So being a joint U.S. and Russian endeavor, its orbit has to go high enough latitude-wise that they, they can reach it from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan, the main Russian launch facility. So it has to go further north than 46 degrees north, which is where the latitude of, of, of Baikonur. So in fact, the space station goes as high north as 50 degrees latitude. This is what we mean by 51.65 degrees inclination. That just means the latitude. So it goes as high north as 51.65 degrees latitude, that is the latitude roughly of uh, Oxford, England. It's a little further north than Vancouver, British Columbia. And that means it also goes all the way down to 51.65 degrees south latitude, which is below the two main islands of New Zealand. So that tilt means that 90% of humanity gets to see the space station in the sky. By comparison, the Hubble Space Telescope here has a 28.5 degree inclination. That means it only goes as high as 28.5 degree, degrees north latitude, which is northern Florida, down to 28.5 degrees south latitude, which is sort of southern Brazil. That means far less of the world gets to see the Hubble Space Telescope. And even when you see it, it's often quite low in the sky unless you're in the tropics. So that is the other reason why the space shuttle is absolutely your ideal satellite to view. Besides being so bright, it's at an angle that puts it high in the sky for most of us in the temperate zones as well as the tropical zones of our planet. It's the perfect satellite. So what I wanted to do is uh, now go and talk about how to figure out when these things are going to appear in the sky. So I'm going to escape out of this here and uh, bring up a website that will allow us to figure out the appearance of the space station. So there's a couple of really good websites here for this, and we are posting them in the chat and pinning them. So uh, first of all, here we have the website called Spot the Station. So Spot the Station is a NASA website. It's been around for about eight years. And so the space station basically uh, is the site that NASA has created to make it really easy to figure out when the space station is going to appear. So here's a map in the center of this site. Again, we are pinning this in the chat if you want to go to that. Uh, Spotthestation.nasa.gov. Really user-friendly. 
So here we are. Here is Jersey City, where we are located. And again, you can move this around to different locations. If you click on the marker there, it gives you the sighting opportunities for the space station for the next 10 days for that region. So I'm going to go down and highlight in gray. So in gray, we've now marked off that appearance that's happening tomorrow night, the 18th. So here is Friday the 18th at 8.14 p.m. it will appear. It's going to be visible for five minutes, and the maximum height will be 76 degrees. That's really important, is how high in the sky is it going to be. The horizon is zero degrees, top of the sky is 90, so 76 degrees is way high up. It's like 80% up between the horizon and the top of the sky. Now, another way to figure degrees, by the way, is just to use your hands. And so, for example, if you take your, your finger and hold it at arm's length like this, your finger is about 2 degrees. So your palm is about 10 degrees. So if you're trying to figure out how high 76 degrees is, you can uh, put your hand so that you have your pinky on the horizon, and it's about 7.5 palms is how high the space station will be in the sky at its highest tomorrow night. It also tells you it will appear in the west-southwest, as we saw, and will disappear in the northeast. Now notice for all of these appearances, the station doesn't generally appear until it's at least 10 degrees above the horizon. Until then, it's in shadow. So you almost never see a satellite right on the horizon. It's got to be at least 10 degrees or one full palm above the horizon before it actually appears. So it's a convenient way to figure out when space uh, station appearances will occur. This diagram they have here as well is very handy. This is kind of a generic picture, but it actually works very nicely for the appearance at 8.14 tomorrow night. So it'll appear over here, 10 degrees above the horizon, <clears throat> in the west-southwest, get up high in the sky. In our case, instead of 66, it'll be 76 degrees above the horizon tomorrow and then disappear over in the northeast in this case. So this gives you a nice path as well. Now the other thing is that uh, what if I don't live in the northeast? So first of all, what I'm saying about the appearance tomorrow, it's gonna be true for Jersey City, for Boston, for New York, and for Philadelphia, for example. But as you go further afield, then what I'm giving you in terms of this appearance will not be the same uh, timing. So if we instead change our location, so here we are again, uh, looking at Jersey City, home sweet home. Let's go ahead, though, and uh, go and change our location on our planet. So say you live in Chicago, OK? So we can go to Chicago, zoom in to Chicago, hit the little marker here, view sighting opportunities for Chicago for the next 10 days. And if we come down here, so I'm highlighting in gray, an appearance of the space station at 7.14, Friday night the 18th, from Chicago. Wait a minute. That's the same appearance that we're going to see in the New York area, but we're on central time now, central daylight time in Chicago, so it'll appear at 7.14. So there's still going to be a lot of daylight in the sky in Chicago at that point, but the station is still bright. You can probably still see it. Uh, it's going to appear at 7.14. It'll be visible for only four minutes, not five or six minutes, and importantly, it's going to be lower in the sky, getting up to only 25 degrees above the horizon, appearing in the south and disappearing in the east-northeast. So it's a handy-dandy guide, no matter where you are, to figure out appearances of the space station. So it can be used. So that's a great thing about this uh, spot, the station site. Very easy to use anywhere on Earth. You can just jump right in and figure things out. But there's a couple of things that it doesn't give you easily, including information on other satellites and also the all-important question, how bright will it be? So that's why this other site that I've been using for 20 years called Heavens Above is also really, really handy. So it's heavens-above.com. Now, I imagine it's long gone, but in the old days, there was also a site called heavensabove.org that was, oddly enough, a lingerie site. So make sure you go to heavensabove.com, and this gives you information on many, many different kinds of satellites. So you uh, enter in the date I've already entered in that we're in Jersey City. 
Look for satellites, come down here, find ISS, that's the abbreviation, of course, for International Space Station. And here again, much as on the spot the station site, it gives you a list of all the upcoming appearances of the space station for our area for the next 10 days. So here we are again, the 18th of September, listing the appearances of the space station and the 19th. So here we are, September 19 and September 18. So if we go to September 18, that is again the appearance of, that we'll see tomorrow night, minus 3.7, again appearing at 814. They show it here in 24 hour clock, so it says 2014, but that's 814, appearing in the west southwest, getting up to 76 degrees, and then vanishing in the northeast. So, this is really important, is how bright it's going to be. So, minus 3.7 magnitude is really, really bright. If you're trying to choose which station appearance to catch, that's going to be the one to go for, as opposed to one, for example, on September 21, that's only minus one magnitude. So this gives you the brightness that's really, really handy for the appearance tomorrow night. And the other cool thing is that if you click on the date, it gives you a star map that shows you the path across the sky. So here we have a map of the sky here for tomorrow night for that 814 appearance. It shows you the station appearing in the southwest and shows you the path it'll take across the sky going past the constellation of the Scorpion going across the center of the sky and disappearing near the constellation of Cassiopeia around uh, uh, 820 or so. Now, star maps, I should mention, have to be hold, held over your head for all the directions to line up with correctly, but it gives you a very nice sense. Uh, quite often, you're, when, when a satellite is rising, it's coming over buildings, it's lost in the clouds on the horizon. So having a map of the sky like this is a really helpful guide to figure out the exact path. And it very clearly points out uh, that it's going to go right across the center of the sky. So very handy. Again, heavensabove.com, a site I've used for 20 years and I find very, very helpful. So the other big advantage, besides giving you information on the brightness of the space station, is that Heavens Above gives you all of these other satellite pieces. So I mentioned the Hubble Space Telescope. That is the second brightest satellite, the second biggest satellite. It's a good also ran. And if you come down here under satellites, all the various listings down here, we have Hubble Space Telescope. So let's go ahead and check out the appearances from New Jersey of the Hubble Space Telescope in our skies for the next 10 days, just by clicking on this link. Uh-oh, there, here it is. Hubble Space Telescope, visible passes for, New Jer for Jersey City. No visible passes found within this search period. Why? Well, because it orbits primarily over the tropics, and there's long stretches where you can't see the Hubble Space Telescope from our latitude here in New Jersey. But if I click on this arrow, which will show us the ensuing next 10 days, let's go ahead and do that. And here from September 27, that's 10 days from now, through October 7, we do have some appearances in New Jersey of the Hubble Space Telescope. But notice a couple of important things. Brightness, first of all. All of these brightnesses are only third magnitude. That is dimmer than the stars that make up the Big Dipper, compared to minus three magnitude, three times as bright as Jupiter for the space station. So Hubble is intrinsically, it's a smaller satellite. It's higher up than the space station. It's not going to be as bright. The other thing to notice, the highest point here, 11 degrees, 12 degrees, 12 degrees, 14 degrees. The highest that ever gets in these set of viewings here is only 14 degrees above the horizon. That is about one and a half palms. So quite low in the sky. We can see that if we find the highest pass of 14 degrees above the horizon here on the 29th of September, click on that to get the map. You can see it's a very low pass for the space telescope. So overall, if, especially if you're trying satellite hunting for the first time, I would highly recommend going with the space station first. That is uh, going to be the easiest one to find. So again, two sites here. They're both in the, pinned in the chat. So heavensabove.com is really great for giving you a wide range of satellite information and also for giving you information on uh, different satellites besides the space station. And the spot, the spot, station uh, site from NASA is a really user-friendly user one. 
So to wrap things up, let's imagine, I mentioned without showing it yet, that there's a great pass also on Saturday night. So tomorrow night, 8.14 to 8.20, great appearance of the space station. Saturday, for the Northeast, we're expecting better weather than Friday. There's a really bright appearance as well around 7.27 in the evening. So let's just practice by imagining we're going to try to get the information and then observe that pass. So we're going back to heavensabove.com. Here are satellites. We're going down to satellites ISS for International Space Station. And then we're looking for September 19 now. So here it is, September 19, minus 3.7 magnitude. So that appearance on Saturday night, the 19th, is going to be just as bright as the one on Friday night, the 18th. It's going to be minus 3.7, three times as bright as Jupiter. It's going to appear at 727 or 1927 in the southwest, due southwest. And it's going to get to 62 degrees in height two-thirds of the way up in the sky, nice and high. And it will vanish then in the east-northeast. So that is on Saturday night. Uh, if we click on here, we can also get the map showing you. Yet, Yes, indeed, it's going to be a great pass across the sky, appearing exactly in the southwest and then traveling across the sky to the northeast. So armed with that information, you're now ready to head on out and observe the space sh station going across the sky on Saturday night. That brings me to one last site I wanted to show you about. So this is a planetarium on your computer system called Stellarium. It's a totally free software. This is also pinned in the chat window. It's called Stellarium. And you can download it. And if you update all the information on satellite passes, it can show you also that when the satellite passes happen. And so this is really handy dandy to verify appearances of satellites, and also as a way just to explore the night sky in general. So Stellarium, great site. And so here we are now set up. It is now Saturday night. It's 2020. It is September. It is the 19th. It is 1920 or 720, and we're facing the right way, looking towards the southwest. So imagine you've gone out there. Imagine it's going to be beautiful as it's supposed to be. As you're waiting, it's about seven minutes before the space station appears, you may want to also try to find the moon. The moon is just past being a new moon. We should have a beautiful crescent there in the sky on Saturday night. First time, the first time in this cycle, the moon should be visible. It'll be Saturday night, so try to find that. You may notice that Mercury is also listed as being here in the sky, although Mercury, being rather faint, and near the setting sun. It's going to be really, really hard to find Mercury. They say one person in a thousand sees Mercury in their entire lifetime and knows they're seeing it. So if you spot Mercury, good on you, but it's going to be very hard to catch it. But try it. If you're, you know, if you're out there anyway, Saturday night, waiting for the station to appear, find the moon and then look down to the right below the moon. And if you see a dot at all there between the moon and the horizon, you found Mercury. The other planets in the sky, by the way, the other bright planets, Jupiter, Saturn, uh, Mars, and Venus, are blazingly bright this entire fall. It's only Mercury that we're having a hard time catching. All right, but we're not here to see Mercury. We're here to try to find the station. As per our map and our Heavens Above info, it's supposed to appear right here in the southwest. And so let's imagine we've gathered a circle of friends, and there's a lot of excitement building as we predicted the appearance of the station. If the station appears on cue, your friends will think you have magical powers. If it doesn't appear, well, better luck next time. So let's start the clock going here. It's now going to it's, uh, 20 minutes, 721. Nothing there yet, of course, 722. It's supposed to appear directly in the southwest. Now you're getting the butterflies in your stomach as you're hoping it's going to appear on cue. Now heading towards 724. Now your friends are saying, are you sure, Mike, that you had the information right? Ah, uh, and then look, here it is appearing. Again, in real life, you're going to have to wait probably to 727 before it appears. But uh, it will be above the horizon and visible by 727 and shining very very bright. So the magnitude here, 
uh, will be uh, all the way heading up. Right now, it's minus 3.39. It'll peak at minus 3.7 magnitude for the Saturday night appearance. Uh, let me back up here so we can kind of track it again. That's the only thing about Stellarium I wanted to mention is that if you hit the wrong button, it speeds up the sky really, really fast. Let's take it more slowly, and now I'm going to mark it off as well. Two clicks, and you can see it. Again, that steady motion across the sky. Here you can barely see the scorpion, although, again, we're at twilight, so it's going to be hard to see it very clearly. But the space station being incredibly bright, you should have no problem spotting it. You can compare its brightness to Jupiter. It'll, again, be three times brighter than Jupiter. And then as it heads over, it'll head towards the northern sky and will disappear in the northeast uh, around about uh, 731 or so. So as we stop here, uh, it'll be hard to see it in the twilight, but here is a great square of the constellation of Pegasus. And uh, get a little picture on there of Andromeda and Pegasus side by side is going to disappear against the background of these two classic fall constellations. And so that is uh, the appearance that you'll see on Saturday night, the 19th. Again, fantastic appearances both tomorrow night around 8.14 to 8.20 and also Saturday night beginning at 7.27. Now, this show itself is recorded and saved on our website, so if you want to review this information before either appearance, it's going to be right there as a handy-dandy reference. And also, these websites that we're providing you with are a great way to check to make sure you have the right information. One more thing to mention, about once a month, they boost the altitude of the space station, either using the jets on the space station or a visiting spacecraft. When that happens, all the calculations get changed. So it's always good to check the appearance information on the day of before you head out to check out a satellite, any satellite in the sky. So with that, that'll bring us to the end of our formal presentation. We're going to go ahead and uh, see if there are questions that we can answer as well. Thank you for joining us. That ends the formal part of our show. Uh, again, if you'd like to support us, we have a donate button there. We uh, uh, our nonprofit and trying to carry on the torch of astronomy and space education for our region and for the country. And let's go ahead and see about uh, what about tonight, someone was asking. Well, let's see uh, just a moment here. Let me escape out of here. So the question is, what about tonight in terms of appearances of the space station? So uh, in our teach a person to fish approach we're taking here, let's go to tonight. Uh, and if we go to tonight, right, which is the 17th, we actually do have, uh, let me go ahead and bring this on here so you can see it. So here, is, uh, here we are again, heavens above, and we do have uh, two appearances of ISS uh, tonight. So uh, tonight being the 17th, we have one that's minus 2.3 magnitude at 726, and also one that's minus 2.6 magnitude appearing at, uh, at uh, 9 o'clock. And so if you look at, like, it really matters here to check the altitude. So the one that's going to appear at 9 o'clock is going to be 44 degrees. That's pretty high. We can, again, click on and get the map. So the problem is it's not going to be a very long appearance. It's going to come up in the uh, southwest and then vanish after a few minutes. But it's fairly bright. I mean, at minus 2.6 is nothing to, uh, it's uh, brighter than any uh, of the stars in the sky. So if we go back to here and go to tonight's sky and uh, go to 9 o'clock-ish and come around here looking towards uh, the sky. Bring this up again to double check. So it's going to appear here in the southwest at about 9 o'clock. So let's look towards the southwest tonight around uh, 9 o'clock and see if we can spot the station. Cue it up here. Turn off our distracting Ophiuchus at Serpent, Serpent Bear. And so let's start the clock running here tonight, just before 9, see if we can spot the space station 
tonight. And lo and behold, yes, there will be an appearance appearing here in the west-southwest, coming up right at 9.01. And so that will be an appearance you can check out tonight. Again, it won't be as bright as the one tomorrow night, but hey, if you're around uh, tonight, go ahead and check it out, rising around 9.01 and passing fairly close to the bright star Arcturus. And the other advantage of this is that it's at 9 o'clock, so it's going to be fully dark by then. So that'll be a handy-dandy one also. So look towards the west at 9 o'clock tonight, and that's another appearance that uh, you can check out there. Yeah, so Stellarium is quite uh, handy in terms of checking things like this. It'll take a little bit of practice, because a couple of times in Stellarium you hit one button, and all of a sudden time will speed up, and all of a sudden you'll be in 2025. But they're easy things to figure out. Okay, let's check and see if there's any other questions going on here. Uh, Kamea is wondering, why do we need satellites? Uh, and of course, that's a really good question as well. So satellites perform very different functions. The vast majority of them observe the Earth. There are ways to monitor the weather, for example, look out for hurricanes. We have communication satellites. I mean, we can't even imagine our modern day lives without communication satellites. Without them, we wouldn't be able to have all this uh, connectedness that we have with modern day cell phone service, for example. But also a number of satellites like the Hubble Space Telescope are aimed not down towards Earth, but out towards the greater universe. And, and so if you've ever seen some of those amazing shots of Hubble, we've learned so much more about the telescope because we have this satellite called the Hubble Space Telescope almost 400 miles above our thick, turbulent atmosphere. It allows us to see the universe far better than ever before. Now, the space station itself is also uh, the only inhabited satellite. And it's also a chance to experience what it's like to be in space for six months or even a year to go, which is great practice for going to Mars, which will be a three-year human mission. And so uh, there are many great uses of satellite uh, uh, satellites, but among them are to observe the Earth, to observe our weather, to observe our oceans, for example. Both uh, NASA and uh, NOAA have very, very robust satellite programs. All right, uh, Ash mentioned she's actually seen Mercury. You are in the one in a thousand person club. So if you come to Liberty Science Center, we're doing a whole show right now called Planets Tonight that talk about seeing all the brilliant planets we have in the nighttime sky right now. Jupiter, Saturn, uh, Venus, and Mars are, as luck would have it, very well placed this entire fall for great viewing. Mercury is the only odd one out. It, uh, it can be very tricky to see, and its current appearance is a very tricky and, and hard to see appearance, but it's like, good on you that you've seen the planet Mercury. I've seen it several times, but not as many as you might expect for someone who d does this for a living. Sneaky Mercury. Uh, what is the speed of the space station? It goes uh, around 17,000 17, miles per hour. It goes around the planet Earth, which has a circumference of 24,000 uh, miles, is what it takes to go around the Earth once. And going about 17,000 miles an hour, it goes around the Earth in just uh, over 90 minutes. So going extremely fast. Hello from Ira. Yes, is that 727 time uh, correct? So for Iowa, you definitely have to go on, online and check the appearance of the station from your location because that far west of the East Coast, it will definitely be uh, on a different timing than the appearances that we'll see here in the East Coast. So Buffalo, this timing uh, should be good that we talked about today for the New Jersey area. It should still be good for Buffalo as well. Buffalo, by the way, well-placed for the total solar eclipse coming up in 2024. You can bet we'll be doing a lot of programming on that. Uh, yes, Carolyn is wondering about the haze. So you may have noticed that even here on the East Coast, the last couple of days, the sun has looked quite eerie with the haze around the sun. So we're hoping that the station will be so bright that if, if there is haze to, uh, tonight or tomorrow or Saturday, 
that we'll be able to see the station through the haze. But obviously, if the sun gets lost in the haze, that means the space station will not be visible either. Sorry, my face is disappearing as I lean over to check the uh, various appearances here. See if there's any other questions here. Uh, so Bridget is wondering if a telescope can be used to see any detail on the ISS. So that's a great question. It's really hard to follow along the ISS. Uh, if you know exactly how to take a picture through a telescope with a camera, you can occasionally resolve the ISS and actually see that it's not just a point of light, but it is rather tricky for most of these appearances. A telescope or binoculars is, is not that helpful. It's more a naked eye object, very much like uh, observing a shooting star is, for example. Uh, do space stations help us to know the orbits of planets? So most of what we know about planets we've observed from Earth or from Earth orbit. Uh, the space station is uh, very useful for observing, of course, planet Earth. And unlike the other satellites, there's human beings on board the space station. They can decide to focus on certain things of Earth very quickly in a rapid response as they pass over, over uh, a given part of the planet. So, uh, yeah, as we're wrapping up here, I wanted to mention that, first of all, this will be saved on our LSC in the House site. And on there, as well, we have every single show that we've ever done. We started doing shows back in April, shortly after our closure. So we have things, uh, shows about Mars, about black holes, about galaxies. Pretty much everything the public has expressed interest in, we've done a online planetarium show about. And this one will be there as well, if you wanted to check the information or get another uh, revisit in terms of the timings of these upcoming appearances. But with that, I think we'll go ahead and wrap up the program. So thank you very much for joining us and for supporting us. Uh, Andrew and Krista and I do hope to see you right there at our mothership as well, the planetarium at Liberty Science Center, the largest planetarium in all of America sometime. Thank you for joining us. The show next week, Krista will be talking about Jupiter and Saturn the uh, brilliant planets that are currently in our evening sky and will be with us all the way until December. So with that, thank you all very much for joining us, and we hope to see you someday at the Jennifer Chelsea Planetarium at Liberty Science Center. Bye, everyone.